Hey guys, in this video, we're gonna be talking about an approach to dealing with the micromanager. If you are following on from last week, you will know that uh, this video has actually been split in two because well, it was just a bit too long and I didn't have time to edit it all. So this is part B. If you haven't seen part A, you can go and watch it uh, if you like. I'll put a little link somewhere up on the screen here, uh, but it's probably not essential. Um, you can probably just watch this one. This is the main kind of how-to, uh, the stuff that I've researched in terms of how to actually approach it, um, the, the, the kind of the five-step process that um, I was leading on to from the last video. Enjoy. I'll catch you later. Bye. Okay, step number one. You need to get into the right headspace. Now, this is massive. Probably the most important step of all, and it's before you even kind of begin in a sense. And so I'm gonna spend at least a couple of minutes talking about this. What I mean by getting into the right headspace is that you need to find a way to effectively self-regulate your emotions and, and thoughts. How do you do that? The first thing I'm gonna suggest is that you take a leaf out of Dr. Rock's book on neuroleadership and acknowledge that you have been emotionally triggered. Don't no, do it, more like that's this. That's not how you do it. No, 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 you know what? I'll, no, no, I just no, don't, no, more, more like, don't, don't like that. Don't do it like that. No, no, you know what? You know what? No, 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 don't, don't, don't do it more like that. this. No. And the reason for that triggering is that you have been threatened, either in terms of status. Why doesn't he respect me? Certainty. Where is this going? Autonomy. I really do not like feeling controlled like this. Relatedness. Shouldn't he be on my side? Or fairness. This isn't fair. He certainly doesn't treat Scout like this. This is David Rock's scarf model, and we might do a deep dive on this in another video, but right now I think that if you acknowledge the fact that you've been triggered, and that it is associated with at least one of these five domains, um, and we often all have one particular, that one that we're kind of vulnerable to, like for example, you know, uh, I find that I'm often triggered in the autonomy domain, where if I feel like someone's trying to control what I'm doing, I really don't like that. I like to have my own sense of my own sense of control over what I'm doing, and I think that's probably fairly common, particularly in this in this micromanaging context. But if if you can acknowledge this, I think it it can serve as a kind of self validation, and it can go a long way towards neutralizing. The, the intense emotion that's associated with that, with that triggering. A second thing that I think you can do to improve your mindset in relation to this sort of micromanaging um, thing that's going on is to question the story that you've told yourself about the whole situation and, and open yourself to some alternative explanations. If you feel comfortable trying this right now, you could even bring a particular situation to mind and you can ask yourself, what story am I telling myself about this? Who are the characters in this story? And, and how have I, have I labeled them? Who is the villain in the story? Who is the victim? How certain am I that this reflects reality in all its nuance? And, and what other possibilities could explain the way my boss is behaving? Now, I do want to make clear that in my opinion, there are situations where a form of micromanagement is actually a valuable tool. For example, when I am supervising someone who I know is doing a procedure for the very first time, say like they're doing a lumbar puncture or they're putting in a chest tube, I am going to, I am totally going to micromanage that person. I mean, seriously, to the point where I am saying things like, okay, now I want you to move your needle just five millimeters more towards the patient's head and bring your angle down 10 degrees towards the bed. Whoa, 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 back the other way. Good. Also, when I'm leading a resuscitation or a, a code gray, uh, where we're sort of managing a particularly aggressive uh, a patient, I'm going to assume a style of leadership that is much more command and control than my usual style. These are situations where I perceive there to be uh, very high risk and also very high stakes if things go wrong. So I'm going to try and exert control at a more granular level. And I also feel that being specific and very directive in this context is probably the best way to support the people I'm working with. The point I'm trying to get at here is that it is possible to reframe micromanagement in a more neutral light. That is that rather than 
being a universally bad thing, there is actually maybe a time and a place for micromanagement. And really the problem exists not in the fact that the micromanagement exists at all, but in that it is a tool which, depending on the context in which it is applied, can be either extremely valuable or extremely damaging. So when you're asking yourself all these questions, as I know you will, consider the possibility that the boss's behavior has actually been driven by their perception of risk. As Professor Jenny Chapman says, it's more about your boss's level of internal anxiety and the need to control situations than anything about you. Maybe they have some information that you don't have. Maybe a previous bad experience is driving their behavior. Maybe their perception of their behavior is, is that they're being supportive and, and protecting you. Maybe they just have a personality that predisposes them to anxiety and the only way they know how to deal with that is to exert more control. Okay, time out. I just wanna be clear that I am not saying that so-called micromanagers don't exist. There are people for whom the command and control leadership style is absolutely their default style and for whom micromanagement is a long-term intractable pattern and there's pretty good evidence to suggest that that can be really, really bad for an organization. The point I'm making here is that the way you frame the situation is likely to significantly impact your ability to self-regulate your own emotions. So the goal here is to loosen the grip that those emotions have on you so that you can access your most intelligent self and effectively deal with the situation. And that is the case even if you really are dealing with a genuine micromanaging boss. Okay, now that we have got ourselves into a better headspace, let's move on to step two. Show them that you've got things under control by feeding them information. So earlier in the video, we talked about how the sense of micromanagement can grow out of the sense that you have, well, you have things under control, but that the behavior of your boss suggests to you that they don't think so. In other words, they don't trust you. We also just visited the fact that this behavior is usually driven by anxiety. So how do you let them know that you've actually got things in hand, that you're actually, you're in charge and you've got things under control and that they can actually trust you and they can relax? Well, you, you could just tell them, hey, relax, I've got things under control here. But as we've already seen, anything that could be interpreted as pushback or resistance can actually engender more anxiety in the other person and therefore more micromanagement. Instead, let's draw on a very old principle of great communication and great storytelling, actually, particularly when you're trying to build a new and convincing narrative in someone else's mind. The principle is that it is better to show than it is to tell. So how do you show someone that you've got things under control? Well, according to ex-Navy SEAL and leadership consultant Jocko Willink, hey, you feed them information. What kind of information? Well, you need to show them that you understand the situation. So here's my take on the situation. We've got this 68 year old man with severe pneumonia, hypertensive, hypoxic, but responding to fluids and supplemental oxygen. I think he's still at really high risk of deterioration. You need to show them that you have a plan to address the situation. Be specific, use precise language if you can. So just to give you a sense of my plan. I'm gonna give him a gram of captrixone and 500 milligrams of azithromycin, IV stat. Uh, I'll start him on some high flow oxygen. Uh, we will titrate his stats to 92% and uh, I'll give him a liter of saline and see if he responds to that uh, with regards to his blood pressure. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna set up a noradrenaline infusion. Uh, we'll get organized with um, an arterial line and I'm gonna prepare for intubation just in case he deteriorates uh, a little more quickly than we're anticipating. And you need to commit to providing an ongoing stream of updates. If it's okay, I'd really be keen to update you uh, when I've completed each of these steps to see, let you know how things are going or, or certainly if anything unexpected arises. Okay, step number three. Ask for their input. They've been itching to give you their input anyway. So why not neutralize that itch? by asking for it. So what are your thoughts? Uh, am I missing anything from your perspective? Now, if you've done a good enough job of thinking about the problem, thinking through your solution, and actually articulating all that to them in the previous step, maybe they won't have anything to add at this point. Eh, it sounds like you got things under control. I'll just be right over here if you need me. 
Or maybe they'll add something of real value, some aspect of the problem that you hadn't considered. Have you run a PCR on him? Might be useful just to see if there's any viral component. Either way, make sure you thank them. Thanks, that's been really helpful. Even if they add something that you already thought of, and maybe you even already said. And I'd probably give him a litre of fluid as well. I would take Willink's advice here too. Hey! Check your ego and thank them anyway. Thanks. That's been really helpful. All right, step number four. Make a specific request. Now maybe, hopefully, by this stage, <clears throat> the boss is sufficiently reassured to have left you to your own advices. But if they haven't, it's time to make a specific request. But as Willink suggests, make it about you, not about them. And again, reassure them that you'll keep them updated. If you feel comfortable with the idea, I'd love the opportunity to continue working on this independently. I'll be sure to keep you updated and, and you know, let you know if anything unexpected arises or if I'm feeling out of my depth. Now, hopefully by this stage, you've managed to negotiate a little bit of room and autonomy for yourself. Uh, but it is entirely possible, particularly if the situation is part of a long-term pattern of micromanagement that the problem is yet to be solved. If that is the case, you need to decide whether you're prepared to sit down and have a dedicated, serious conversation about the situation. A difficult conversation. Now, if you're unsure how to even get started with this kind of conversation, then you should watch this video next. Or if you're after a specific tool to assert yourself without triggering defensiveness in the other person, then I suggest you watch this video. Thank you so much for watching guys. If you found this material useful, give us a thumbs up and share it with a friend or a colleague. Comments or questions, leave them below. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.